welcome to Lush Future. Uh, today's interview uh, is our first international interview, and the title of the episode is Hacker Culture Goes Mainstream. Uh, initially de developed as a community whose only participants were largely considered even by their peers to be social outcast, basement-dwelling computer guys, I would like to posit the following. As a result of both corporate and governmental forces, hacker culture has since been co-opted and integrated into mainstream culture for profit, consolidation of power, and restriction of competing models. Um, our guest today is, like I said, our first first guest and first international guest, uh, Tom Secker, host of Clandest Time, <clears throat> Investigating the Terror, and Spy Culture. He's here to provide us with a perspective on hacker culture from outside the bubble of technical jargon and career programming. So thank you so much for, for coming on the show today, Tom. Well, thanks for having me. It's good to be talking to you. And I have to say, I do like that picture behind you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's a... Uh... It's 3,000 faces. It's everyone who's infamous or famous since like 1900. It's actually a cool little shot. <laughs> um, so I, I actually just kind of would like to begin by uh, asking you just what comes to mind when you when you think of the phrase hacker culture? Um, what comes to mind for me? Oh, <laughs> you, I mean, you've asked a pretty open-ended question, there, mm -hmm. but fair enough. Um, I suppose two different things primarily because that would fit in with my two sort of major interests and my two major whatever research areas, what you, what you might call them. Um, first would be hackers in Hollywood, because this is something, particularly after uh, the Edward Snowden thing, when I went back and I thought, you know, how much of this story, this Edward Snowden story that we were being fed, um, how much of this occurred in films? You know, mm -hmm. what kinds of certain details but also certain if you like the shape of the story the notion of the guy who was on the inside and thought he was doing the right thing and then decided oh no no there's something desperately wrong with this and now i've got to go and tell everyone and the important thing here is for everyone to know about this that sort of a story that sort of an arc how common is that in in hollywood it's massively common the whole snowden thing is intensely hollywood in its in its execution in its narrative in its the whole shaping of the discussion around that right mm -hmm. so so there's that if you like element mm -hmm. to it mm -hmm. and then there is the more explicitly intelligence angle to this that i've always you know had this really really uneasy feeling um that just as the internet started out in some ways as a military project right mm -hmm. um, at mm -hmm. least technologically speaking um I'm not talking about, you know, the modern internet with all the content that's on it, but in terms of the, you know, the hard stuff um, and the soft stuff, I would assume, um, you'd know more about that than I would, right? But. Yeah, <clears throat> no, I, 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 that actually is something that I, I was really hoping to get into is just really, it's almost like, uh, like the internet itself is an extension of hacker culture, uh, just by its very like kind of technological foundations. Uh, watch, watch, I had sent you a, a documentary last night to, to kind of watches a preface of, uh, called hackers wanted and one of the things that that kind of struck me coming out of it was that just this concept that uh basically there's uh <clears throat> there were a like the oldest files on the internet are all put there by hackers like they, there's no other way around that like the oldest things you can find in this digital landscape are left they, they are kind of uh, they had to originate from almost definitely the hacker culture um, well, yeah, because as, as that documentary actually laid out pretty well, um, where else could you expect it to come from? Who right. the hell else would have been using the Internet back then? <laughs> right, right. I mean, we, as, we were both probably too young anyway to be mm -hmm. using it in any meaningful way. We might have, I mean, that, even that would have been later, even when we were using it just for email or whatever in the right. early days of the Internet, our Internet use. Even then, we wouldn't have been you know, uploading files to the Internet and creating websites or any kind of archive or whatever. Right. Um, because what the hell would we have been interested in that? So it had to be people who were, as the film explains, people who have a certain desire to try and <laughs> solve problems, sometimes invent problems for themselves to solve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but often they are actually solving real problems. You're talking about, you know, it's people with that sort of creative engineering mind of some sort. It doesn't really matter what problem it is they're trying to approach you could call that a hacker and i think that's fair enough it's not something i'd really considered before i always you know typically thought of the hacker as like i say the sort of hollywood or edward right. snowden type because that's the story that's so common um but i think the film's right i think that anyone with that sort of mind could be considered to be engaging in that and so of course the internet 
culture, at least to some extent, grew out of that and had to because, like I say, no one else would have been interested. No one else would have bothered. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they were using essentially a military framework to do this and the way that that has developed into this very, very symbiotic relationship between hacker culture and military intelligence circles, that's something that has always bothered me. And, or at least it's always bothered me as soon as I had any concept of this and as soon as I had any concept, what is it that hackers are actually doing? Um, right. <laughs> and and right. what's the response to this, I suppose? I, I thought... This is this is just another one of those. It's, it's just like terrorism, you know, right? Um, isn't it? You tell right. me it's not wrong. I so I I I think you're totally right. I think it's very common uh, that, especially nowadays, like hacker is <clears throat> both the connotation and the denotation have somehow changed to be negative, and yet it the people who first described themselves as that, um, I like that. I, it blew my mind when I found out it was the term hacking originated out of the, the tech model railroad club at MIT, people souping up their model <laughs> trains like that didn't that doesn't even come close to what people think about nowadays, where they're really just taking like, oh, let's overload this capacitor or put it in some other, you know what I mean? Let's solder this part here. And all of a sudden, boom, my model train goes faster. That was that was the origin of the term. And those guys took pride in their ability to. Uh, as Stallman, Richard Stallman, uh, author of the 1985 book, Free Software, Free Society, he defined hacking as playful cleverness. And I think that that's like a fantastic description for a large majority of at least what people who would describe themselves as hackers would would kind of consider it, uh, especially more. Well, obviously, I guess you wouldn't describe yourself as a hacker if you're a malicious hacker. You probably would tell nobody about it, which is kind of besides the point. Um, but sure, the, sure. <laughs> so uh, that that being said, I, I think you're you're dead on. I think there is this there is a really interesting kind of dichotomy between what what the term hacking means to people who just see it in movies and see it in TV uh, versus what it means to people who. I, I just keep describing this hacker culture as if it really is a thing, and it is much more. It's amorphous, like any any culture. But it, I think that who is the people within the hacker culture definitely would consider themselves uh, not consider it a, a negative term at base, like like they would uh, in the mainstream kind of media or movies. Um, no, sure they wouldn't. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'll certainly take your opinion. No, I think that I think that there's like uh, nobody likes to look. Nobody wakes up. At, I, I, I feel like it might even have been one of your podcasts. It was like nobody wakes up and, and says like, uh, it's like, I'm going to be a bad guy today. Like that's, you don't think you're being a bad guy most of the time. But when like the, when this kind of hacker culture spawns, uh, like I guess when the, the, when a bunch of kind of clever engineering type people get together to, to build these systems, I mean, even amongst their peers, they're experimenting with kind of radical uh, boundary pushing at, at different levels of each system and i think that it's what's very interesting to me and this will kind of lead into our first question or my first question for you um is that it really doesn't uh it doesn't seem like the hacker mindset really lends itself to uh appreciating systems of authority i mean i think that the whole concept of kind of playfully or at least just cleverly modifying a system to to improve it for one way, like one reason or another, uh, just not necessarily in, improve it, but to have that kind of control over it kind of requires a lack of uh, like strict oversight and regulation. And, and I think that the hacker mindset does kind of come at odds with a lot of kind of uh, structures of control, like be it law or be it uh, like digital rights management and in, in like protecting MP3 files or something. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how it, how possible it is. And I think that this this kind of leads closer into your realm. Uh, like how like is it possible that the hacker culture was kind of glorified as a result of the intelligence apparatus trying to recruit hackers? Like did they make it seem more uh, more cool because they needed to hire them? Like I, it doesn't seem to me as a programmer. I don't really think that people outside of programming the like. I don't know the the world of programmers or software des developers. I don't think many of them actually consider hacking to be cool, but it does seem like it is glorified or kind of displayed in that way uh, in a lot of mainstream media. And I'm not quite sure whether that's a like what that is a result of. Uh, did, do you have any any input on that? 
It's yeah, that is an interesting question. I suppose. Well, it goes back to what you're saying. You're talking about people who have this sort of, like I say, a, a creative engineering mindset. Um, they are problem solvers. But in order to solve a problem, you have to, to a certain extent, be working within a system. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what all engineering is. And that's absolutely fine if for most of the things that we uh, use engineering for. Um, <laughs> Right. And, and indeed, most I, I imagine most of the people who are actually hacking are just, like the film said, are just curious people, right? Mm -hmm. They're just looking to see if something's there, see if they can get into something, basically. Right. See if there's a hole there for them to get through. Um, and, and it's not necessarily that they mean any more than that, and that they're after any more than that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I'm all in favor of that, of course. But... Mm -hmm. um, when you then get into that sort of weird symbiotic relationship between the hackers and the military intelligence people, and it, like you say, why is this so glorified in Hollywood and in mainstream culture? And quite a lot of the films that do this are films that have military intelligence connections in their production. So there's clearly something going on there. My suggestion is, I think you've actually already hit on it, that if you're inherently having to work within a system because that's if you like that's what comes naturally to you is that how do i make a system work better mm -hmm. that's i mean that's what comes naturally to most engineers it's not necessarily how do we invent something out of the blue it's how do we take what we've already got build on that refine it you know make a car right. 20 percent more fuel efficient whatever mm -hmm. um like i say nothing inherently wrong with that but it does mean that that sort of mindset never lends itself to questioning is this system actually inherently valid itself or is it just something that's useful because that's, most of the time it's just about if it's useful that's a um, really really interesting point actually i hadn't even <clears throat> i hadn't even thought of that 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 perspective of it but i think you're you're absolutely right there is a there is an inherent kind of like acceptance of the current system just to be able to tweak it huh that's a really really good good thought actually i think you're you're dead on with that and so as a result, what you've got are people who aren't particularly prone to questioning authority. They might sometimes, they might sometimes say, you know, actually this, but again, it will usually be in the sense of a frustration with the failing, uh, the failures of the system in terms of its use, in terms of its how well it's functioning. They'll get pissed off about that and say, why can't we just sort of, you know, get rid of half of this stuff and then build mm -hmm. something else in its place. And that, again, Nothing inherently wrong with that mindset, but when you've got people who can do that, <clears throat> excuse me, who can do that sort of thing, but aren't particularly prone to questioning authority or towards, I suppose, individuality. Um, I don't. Uh, some people will find that quite insulting, but I kind of mean it in in the best way. Um, because that's what questioning authority, I think, always comes down to. It always comes down to an affirmation of your own authority. And mm -hmm. if you don't have that characteristically, then you probably won't ever end up in this weird symbiotic relationship between hackers and the military intelligence. But you see what I mean? They're the sort of people that they'd look for. That hmm. exact sort of person is very useful to the NSA, to military intelligence, to the CIA, because they are very useful people, usually very clever people, people who, within a system, can make refinements and make that system work a whole lot better. So they're incredibly useful to that sort of an agency. So yeah, I think it's that's the type of person they're targeting. So that's what they're glorifying and, and sexing up in films like Enemy of the State and whatever. Right. And it's not just about recruitment. Um, I, that's I, a big part of it. It's also about just glorifying that kind of mentality and trying to encourage people, I suppose, into that kind of a mentality as well. And to see that as, you know, that that's the good thing to be. If you're not like that, you're kind of jealous of the fact that you can't hack into a system and do all this, you know, clever shit with computers. Right. So it's it kind I, of has that effect on people who aren't ever going to be recruited by an intelligence service. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, I, I would actually like to, to even take that one step further and say not only are they trying to recruit them, I think that it almost appears as if they're trying to grow them. It's like as, as, as if they're, they want they want more of them. Like, I, I don't they know they're not going to recruit them all. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw the uh, there's an article maybe within the past year uh, where the FBI was having trouble hiring hackers because none of them like could pass a drug test. Every single one of them had at least pot in their system. So it's like at a certain point, it's like. A whole it's it's almost like their rules are causing them to fail at their own game and it's actually it's it, i think that that is 
to some degree you could see like uh like how some of the copyleft or creative commons stuff could be considered like a hack of copyright and and that i think is there are different ends of this as far as how the game can be played and i don't think hacking is necessarily a technological thing although in this context of, of our conversation it, it definitely is um i i think that that mindset does lend itself to uh like for example figure out how to abuse a fair use uh privilege to be able to then like actually reproduce somebody else's media on uh in one of my podcasts or something like that like that would be uh, and I'm, I'm sure uh, to some degree, I think that you you hack the copyright a little bit and, and with some of your podcasts in the same way. So, the <laughs> well, certain, certainly if YouTube's consistently banning my videos and placing restrictions on my account is anything to go by. <laughs> well, all right, maybe not necessarily successfully every time, but <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, the attempt is there. Um, yes, no, and I think this is uh, I think this is super super interesting, and I think it. Uh, that you've definitely touched on this in, in quite a few different uh, different podcast years, but is there anything in particular, I guess, that uh, that, that kind of came to mind uh, in watching this documentary like uh, last night that was new to you or kind of was unfamiliar to you in terms of how, how to think about the culture, the perspective on it? Well, I suppose it, it, it brought a, a certain degree of clarity to my thinking on this in terms of how we... Uh, how we delineate between different parts of the hacker culture. Like you said before, it is this relatively amorphous or at least multiform thing. Right. Um, it's not one thing by any means. So the bit that you you were specifically talking about that is very much promoted in military intelligence productions and just in pop media in general, there is that. Mm -hmm. There is also the just sort of randomly curious people. Um, there are also people like me who aren't, as you said at the top, aren't, I mean, I'm not a technological person. I know I've built websites and run a podcast and things, but frankly, you don't have to be that technologically savvy to do these things. Um, but there again, I had to just learn how to do them. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hire anyone to do this. I didn't get lessons off anyone in how to do these things, really. I just set about trying to do it and sort of improved as I went along and learned as I went along. And if I needed to find something out, you know, I used I used a search engine <laughs> like everyone else. But, right. But so again, I would yeah, I would say I am part of that broader hacker mindset that mm -hmm. you're talking about. And and again, I'm someone who I have a big thing about wanting to know state secrets. Um, I don't hack into military websites or anything like that, but I do I do try and use things like. Uh, archive research and search functions i try and use those very creatively i try and think laterally you know what other term could this come under mm -hmm. that kind of thing because you never know what one document might call psychological warfare another one will call a morale operation say mm. of course <laughs> so, <clears throat> if you just search under psychological warfare you get a whole batch of stuff but it means you'll be missing a whole chunk of other stuff that might actually be more interesting um, or at least provide you with some details that you wouldn't have otherwise got and therefore a, bit, a better picture of, you know, what are the state secrets. So That's... in terms of that kind of thing, yeah, I'm part of the hacker culture. So it very much brought that home to me. Yeah, that's what the documentary probably really did more than anything else. Cool. I um, I actually am super glad you, you, that you got that. And I think that kind of comes back to our kind of kind of my, my original premise uh for this whole conversation which is it's not necessarily that hacker culture went ma went mainstream so much as hacker culture built the internet so the internet is hacker culture and the internet went mainstream <laughs> so, yeah and i think that 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 kind of follows and i think that it is almost like a snowball to a certain degree like a snowball effect as far as how people as people get deeper and deeper into using the web on a daily basis, just the average person going walking down the street, they are going to encounter more and more of these terms. They're going to encounter more and more of these different subcultures that are, whether they're new or old, I can guarantee the oldest ones are of this culture. And so there's kind of like this rooted mindset in the internet that it has kind of proliferated. And I mean, you'll see it in uh, it probably has changed in the past three to four years, but I mean, for a very, very long time and still so I'm sure uh, like large swaths of say like Reddit or, or any of these uh, big discussion sites that that mentality is very strong and very alive. Like it's very much exists, I think still and, and has kind of set the, the, the precedent for what kind of communicate like conversations go on or what people are okay with. And, it may even lay the foundation of this kind of 
uh, I don't know, this kind of like in, insubordination or, or subversive type type mentality in a lot of different ways. But it, I think that that definitely rears its head in, in very strange ways, especially as it's been as businesses have consumed it um so that's uh that actually kind of kind of leads into to my next my next question actually in uh just as a as a quick example of it in i think it was clandestine 24 uh the intelligence industrial complex uh you and james or uh corbett were chatting about uh the commodification of information and i think that especially when <laughs> they're all trying to commoditize com like potentially discussions on the internet that information is hacker culture information in some ways. But that said, more and more people, uh, almost four months after your your podcast, uh, Wired had an article, the headline, Data is the New Oil of the Digital Economy. And I think that similarly to how the uh, intelligence apparatus saw these individuals as people that they needed to get on their side or at least to have more of because you know we have to have the smarter guys to fight the less smart guys or something like that mm -hmm. i think that corporate in interest has very similarly uh tried to to glorify hackers because they realize they also want these guys i mean i i think that it's arguable that google if you had a hack off between google and the government i'm not sure who would win i'll be honest <laughs> No, that's a, that's, a, that's a fascinating <laughs> way of putting it. Not that that would ever happen. Probably. No, 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 because they, of course, <laughs> are working. <laughs> Celebrity guests. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yes. See, that, that actually sounds like an awesome show. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, an awesome spy film. It really uh, it, yeah. Uh, that being said, it probably already is one that I'm not sure the name of. <clears throat> um yeah, so I mean, I, as far as I mean, do you think that the the corporate uh, corporate interest in hackers would be the same, or at least because I, I obviously these films, a large chunk of them are not necessarily funded. <clears throat> a large chunk of them are affiliated, funded with with uh, like the intelligence or the military industrial apparatus. I don't think that all of them are right, and 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 so would the rest of the movies that involve hackers, like would those be? I mean, do you think that they have more like like the I guess it's hard to say. I don't think I necessarily think that Universal or Pixar is trying to to recruit hackers, but maybe they are. And and would that have the same effect as in terms of producing like uh, mainstream media like that? Yes. Well, I mean, uh, of course, because the, the corporate apparatus, if you like, apparatus. <laughs> <laughs> This is a problem with talking to an American. <laughs> <laughs> my my bad, my bad. I'll say lever instead of lever next time. There, was, <laughs> or, or the other way around. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, it's it's so much bigger. I mean, however big the NSA, the, the Pentagon, the CIA, all, all of that put together is, the the corporate world is bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Um, because let's face it, most of the people employed by the government aren't actually working for military or intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. Um. So you take the corporate world as a whole, it's just bigger, so there's more people. So yeah, and of course they want the people with this sort of mentality as well, people who will function within a system and be quite content functioning within a system as long as they get to play with some stuff and try and make it better and make it work. Because um, that's all they want to do. And like I say, nothing inherently wrong with that. In fact, there's something inherently very good about that. But they want people who, again, aren't going to question authority, aren't going to really you know, buck against anything or overthrow anything or cause any trouble, but will be useful in terms of making all of their various systems that they need to make a corporate machine work, work that little bit better. Right. So they will, of course, they want people like this as well. But there is a sort of a much bigger dynamic, a philosophical dynamic here between, if you like, established power and creativity. Because creativity can always be a threat to established power, always has been, always will be. How established power goes about co-opting that and commodifying that and recruiting that to within itself in a way that not only takes some of its power away, takes some of its threat away, but also makes itself more powerful. That is, if you like, how the whole system works. That's how the whole power system works. So hacker culture is only, I would say, one, argue, one example of how this whole overall process is working. Just like you might say, 
I mean, why do you think it is that the intelligence services have co-opted every radical movement from the Victorian anarchists to the hippie movement, to the Black Panthers, to now the hacker movement, to, you know, anyone? Every time a creative movement springs up that in any way actually poses them some problems, they think, they don't think, how do we destroy this? They think, how can we put this to our use? No. How can we find a use for this? I, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. I think that's I mean, the, the metaphor that comes to mind is the the guy who who it's like rather than trying to divert the parade, you just get in front of it and lead him another way. Like it's it's like that that kind of a metaphor. And I think I think you're you're absolutely right with that. It's I had not even thought about how it would. I mean, you're you're absolutely correct as far as every movement I can think of going back. I mean, back to even your Warsaw anarchists. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> yeah. it's incredible how, how far back this, this kind of concept goes. And it is definitely also, as you say, um, it, there is a level of creative, creative like boundary pushing, but once it is under this umbrella of here's your salary, push it, push the boundaries in this direction. It, it that definitely seems to be, uh, the the case and it definitely seems to be why like google could have encrypted the entire i mean i'm i'm sure this is hyperbole but i'm sure they could have effectively in, spent some energy to basically make transparent encryption exist throughout the rest of the web if they really wanted to but the bottom line is they don't like i i i very much believe in the phrase that if google was on tour the internet would be the outer net and i think that it's totally possible that that there's a like the, unfortunately, the you're right. The resources are there. It's just a matter of where they're being directed. And as far as is there any clear indicator of who's directing it? It's so compartmentalized in both cases, uh, corporate and governmental. It's it's actually very hard to. It's hard to say what they're going to do, but other than control it. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's ultimately what what they want. Um, and mm -hmm. in as much as there is anyone directing this only in the sense that this is again this is how power works so however organized and together the people at the very top may be or however fragmented and anarchic it could be at the top we don't really know because we're not part of that social circle right um either way i think that it, the system would function in the same way because it has to like i say sort of suck in a certain amount of creativity to make the system better to keep it going and actually keep because there are actually all kinds of problems with power systems. There all are. Um, not just the threat posed by creativity, but actually just maintaining a power system in a world where things that that power system relies on are changing and will change and just will, and there's nothing you can do about it except try and adapt in order to survive. Um, <laughs> because there are those real problems, it has to suck in a certain amount of creativity, a certain amount of hackers in order to still be there in 10 20 30 years time and that would be the case even if i don't even if there wasn't anyone at the top i think um uh, it wouldn't make a difference i don't think it does make any difference it would, it would sort of carry on regardless that said i think if there is anyone at the top correcting it it's some people who are, who are pretty screwed up i think uh, emotionally and psychologically and mentally in, in general because <clears throat> because what is it that is being glorified about hacker culture and what is it that is being glorified about open source and all that? It's the very, very worst about these things. It's the erosion of individual privacy. It's, right. it's the notion that even your own bloody thoughts aren't, you know, your own private invasion. <laughs> um, you know, because that's what you're seeing. With, um, and what, what is Facebook at the end of the day? It's something that grows out of hacker culture. It's some... You know, at least that part of the story is probably true. It's probably a bunch of kids, techie kids, who sat down and built something in their bedroom at university, at college, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of investors, all of whom have curious CIA connections, turn up and turn it into the world's, you know, third biggest website or second biggest website or whatever the hell it is now. And where is it that Facebook's enormous revenues and enormous stock value come from? Because it sure as fuck isn't their advertising revenue, because their right. advertising is terrible. Right, right. No one, no <laughs> one clicks on Facebook adverts. <laughs> they can't drive sales at all. I, can't, I cannot believe that. So where is this huge revenue and this huge stock value coming from? Well, it must be that massive amount of data and all of the capacity to 
data mine, but not just data mine, pattern mine. Mm -hmm. That's the more important thing, obviously, for social engineering. That's their value. So this is the, the perfect example. This is, in fact, the archetype of everything we're talking about. But what is Facebook? It's a, a website that encourages very worst about people. It encourages them to give up their privacy and just be completely egoistic and intention-seeking and pathetic and childish. And uh, so this is what I mean. If there is anyone directing this from the top, it's people who want us to be like that. And that is, you know, that's screwed up. Yeah, I, I think I, uh, you, I think you nailed it. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, and never negative. There's no negative feedback on Facebook because you don't want to be rude to your friends, people who you know on a name first name basis. That's not nice. So like, even if you put controversial stuff out there, I haven't had a Facebook account in many years, but I, I definitely remember you put anything with a little bit of controversy it's very likely that like you might get one guy who says something negative about it but then everybody thinks that guy's an asshole and so it's kind of it's tough because you then definitely know everybody and i i think that the zuckerberg again is a great example of this kind of hacker culture be made, being made to look cool i don't know how you can i mean it's it's phenomenal and amazing to me that any uh production house can make it look cool to sit and type on a computer because that's all we're doing like there's nothing there's nothing else going on besides like typing and typing and typing and oh it still doesn't work or hey look i can add a friend now like that's that's the extent <laughs> of yeah. you know what i mean like there's no there's not like neon green lights and fog machines while i'm like with like techno music playing in the room when i'm going to like writing up some code it doesn't it doesn't really happen like that and that's not <laughs> it's nowhere near that cool that being said i I actually watching your, uh, I believe it was your seventh episode on, uh, I think it was uh, James Bond wannabe, perhaps was the name of it. Um, yeah. Was uh, what, my, my question is, when did hacker hacker become or being a hacker become cool if it ever did? And can we blame James Bond? <laughs> and I, we kind of bit. I've thought about it since then. I'm not totally positive, especially in the process of this conversation, if James Bond really is the hacker archetype, but I think that in the James Bond films, the hacker archetype is definitely very prevalent. I mean, do you, do you have anything to in that direction or thoughts in that direction? Sure, sure. No, you're right. James Bond himself is not a, a hacker. He's not a particularly creative person. He is a, you know, he is a fixer. He is a problem solver. He's just sort of standard issue government sociopath, right? Um, he's just a guy they send in to kill people, really, at the, at the base of it. And that's not, you know, not, not something I, yeah, it doesn't fit with the, in any way with the nerd in the bedroom. It doesn't, it doesn't draw those people in. I don't right. think those people, they probably do watch James Bond movies, but they probably don't identify with James Bond. If anything, they identify with the uh, with Q, right? The gadgets mm -hmm. guy. He mm -hmm. would be a hacker. He's a guy who's creating little bits of technology for specific little weird purposes that you might need in some random film-based you know, right. <laughs> circumstance. That, oh, look how useful it is now. Um, <laughs> so, so they would be. He would be the one that they would identify with. I certainly think. And more recently, obviously, they've got a much younger Q for one thing, who I think totally aimed at the. Uh, those sorts of people, and also the last I mean, the last Bond film, Skyfall, um, the main antagonist to James Bond in this, and bear in mind it's the antagonist, it's not the guy you're really, really rooting for, but it's kind of the guy that you kind of are rooting for, because always the villain is more charismatic, <laughs> and he is, and he's a better actor. <laughs> it's more fun playing a villain. That's that's probably true, and and uh, as with many other pieces of, of mainstream culture, I mean, it's it's very common and has been very common for many many years, where the and the the main supervillain of a movie will actually have some truth in some of his statements wrapped in these kind of like uh, I don't know, just overtly horrible ideas, which to some degree will sometimes sway people one way or another, or kind of muddies the water as far as like, oh well, he's espousing something that is definitely within this realm of hacker mentality but then also he wants to like get sarin gas or something like it's <laughs> there's like this kind of like and and i can see that as almost like a muddying the waters to make people less likely to want to do it's, it's almost like to it doesn't necessarily make people jump the sides of the fence but i think it makes the gulf between the two sides larger where it's like if you're already kind of into it you might seek deeper if you're to, if you're not into it you're going to probably stay away um and I, I think that that's there is almost like a, a crystallization or kind of a separation type thing happening because it's like 
the, the <clears throat> let's if you think like the FBI, CIA, DOD, all, all these guys, they don't want necessarily a, a lot more hackers. <laughs> they, they just want we, sort of hackers is, is the question. You know? Right, right. <clears throat> well, like if they, they wouldn't want the mainstream everybody. I'm sorry, uh, this might make more sense. They wouldn't want the mainstream everybody to become a hacker. <laughs> but no, 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 they still need plenty of people to go and, you know, farm fields and, and kill Arabs and all the rest of it. Right, right. It's it, they need the hackers as we go back, you know, going back to what we said before, just to try and, if you like, make the system more efficient and mm -hmm. make it function a bit better and adapt a bit better. But you, James Bond, I mean, this, this character this, that you have inside, he clearly gets on um, Julian Assange, right? I mean, this is it, he's got the same haircut as a guy, for one thing. <laughs> he's you know, sexually a bit weird, which obviously Assange is notoriously. Um, and you know, Assange, Assange himself. Someone I have incredibly odd feelings towards. I really, I struggle to warm to this guy, I have to say, just on a kind of person-to-person -person basis. Mm -hmm. But, you know, WikiLeaks is huge, not exactly a hacking project in the most literal sense, but it's still part of the same culture that we're talking about, isn't it? Yes. Um, or it's a kind of uh, a place for hackers to go. Yeah. I would say, I, th I think the subversive nature of like the idea of WikiLeaks is very much in the realm of the mindset of a hacker where you're just trying to use to currently available systems like the internet to to break other systems almost or to, to tweak its effect on other things in which in this case is, uh, I mean, it's like almost like a like some uh, <laughs> like a so, like a social hack almost where you're trying to hack the the awareness of of the of the the world at large by by kind of presenting this and if the only way to do that is some pseudo anonymous crypto network i guess yeah if it if it works it works and and as far as if it works i don't know the data is out there i could have grabbed it you could have grabbed it did either of us download it no like probably i mean i'm assuming you didn't download it but like there's there's so many different things out there, but I think that actually leads into something that, that I, I, I was thinking about watching the, the that same documentary last night about Adrian Lamo. And I, I thought, I think what's very interesting, and I hope, I'm not sure if you got the same kind of vibe from him, but I think actually a lot of the things he says are actually very good, <clears throat> very good things as far as like within the culture itself and generally like he's saying the right stuff. But something about his personality and something about the connections that he had and <clears throat> how he was carrying himself just came across as just very odd and like really off-putting and and especially having now like now knowing that he was the guy who fingered Bradley Manning I think that it's it's like <clears throat> for someone to say that he that that we should be very uh all of our we, we should always be open in our exploits and tell everybody about it well like but then why are you to what it to what benefit or to, to what end does that actually like does point like i don't know basically snitching on another person for doing what they chose to do um like how does that benefit you like why would you know what i mean i, I did that just there's something about that whole dynamic that really just seemed very strange to me and i he seemed i think to your point as far as talking about the the guys at the top there was a weird like sociopathy thing i think going on i'm not quite sure i mean did you get anything close to the same vibe Oh, we've got a very similar sort of vibe from this guy. Like you say, he says an awful lot of the right things. Um, and I'm always suspicious of anyone who says an awful lot of the right things. Fair. Um, or at least anyone who has an awful lot of notoriety and a big public profile who says what appear to be an awful lot of the right things. Because right. you have to wonder whether someone has to be that well known if they're saying that kind of thing. So clearly that's not what they're saying all the time, is it? Um, I did, yeah, I don't, I couldn't in any way warm to this guy. I was thinking, even though he was saying a lot of things that I thought, yeah, they, you know, fair enough. Um, I'm, or even, I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. I still, by the end of the film, I just sort of thought this guy was fucking weird. He's not the sort of guy you go up and talk to at a party, is he? Um, <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, something about, like, sleeping on buses and in empty warehouses and, like, just, like, kind of running around just to, like, find a new Starbucks to, like, try and hack the local military. Like, it just didn't... Something about it just seemed very off-putting, and I I think that especially, like, after, by the end of the film, you, you know he gets caught, and, I mean, that... Does that not automatically put you on a track to uh, kind of giving up whatever you know about other people in that culture to save your own skin? Like, is there a, 
is there a level of that at play and and what uh, is you yeah, yeah, yeah. aware of that and is that kind of like a very clear i mean it seems very it seems as if it is it to, to me well you you said that, that there was a kind of veneer of sociopathy about him i would say it's it's not quite that far i'd say he comes across as a, as a narcissist he mm-hmm. comes across as a guy who's just completely fucking self-interested so if that means screwing bradley manning over what bradley manning may or may not have done probably did do at least some of it to be fair but um <laughs> whatever i don't give a shit i don't think people should be prosecuted and tortured and thrown in prison for these things i really don't um i don't see that that any of those leaks to be honest we damaged america's national security at all if anything it proved it by having it out there because then people at least had a clue a greater idea of what the hell they were dealing with and um yeah and i think well, even, even furthermore on that same point i think if, if I've, at the very least, now even the military-industrial complex knows where their vulnerabilities are. Like, oh, we shouldn't allow people to just be able to download this stuff and take it home. Like, there's. <laughs> so yes, I think I think your point that might have improved security as well. So I, I yeah, no, that's that's definitely definitely possible. Um, so the. Well, I, and then, I mean, just just to finish up on. Shoot, that, I'm uh, sorry. A guy, um, is is that I thought. He is a classic example, like I say. He does come across as extremely narcissistic and narcissists very, very well in these sorts of systems because they don't really give a damn about the other people around them. So if it comes down to something like having to snitch in order to get ahead, it's very Darwinian in that respect. Narcissists do very well in Darwinian structures. They just do. Um, selfishness works. In, if, you, if your system is very, very competitive. I'm not saying selfishness and com- competitivity are inherently bad, not at all. But if your system only really rewards that, then it's the narcissists and the psychopaths who are going to win. Um, and this guy came across as someone who was mostly interested in the great glory of himself, um, <laughs> quite frankly, rather than anything else. Because he kept saying, you know, uh, the, these rather saccharine things like people accuse you of being a, a hacker or a freedom fighter or whatever the hell they were labeled they were trying to stick on it. It's like, oh no, I'm not that. I'm just a guy trying to do what I'm trying to do. But he didn't come across as a guy who's just trying to do what he's trying to do. He come across as a guy who's got a bigger fucking agenda and his bigger agenda is that he wants to be a big somebody of some kind and didn't really care about the rest. Um, so, yeah, he came across as profoundly dishonest as well. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't buy this guy. I didn't like this guy. I didn't, yeah. I, yeah, and and uh, I think this is kind of similar to to something you first mentioned at the beginning at the outset of this conversation. It seems to me like there is a a, a very common, and I I'm not sure if uh, if you remember the, the very beginning of that documentary. It it starts with like the the prosecution of Galileo, which to me is a little hyperbole <laughs> to say the least, but it's this. I mean, relative to this Adrian guy. Yeah, to. yeah, and I think that there's like a, there's like a, 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 like a thin layer of I'm trying to help. I know how to help. Let me help. And then you see what they're doing to help, and it's like these deceptive duo guys. It's these other guys where they're legit. Just I, oh, but I'm helping. I'm helping. Otherwise, I break into your super secure system and tell you it's broken. And and I think that there's a security expert in the movie that actually has a very good point when he's like. Imagine that network administrator getting that information that, oh, man, my system has been compromised. Do you, like and now and then this guy goes and uh, the guy who compromised it goes and t- like Adrian Lamo would go tell The New York Times or go tell some some big publication. All of a sudden, like you, you think that network manager is going to be happy that this guy is like exposed that that he found this flaw and the guy the, that it had been made open to him i don't think that this like i think it's very obvious that this guy would a yeah probably lose his job and b probably be very upset if he didn't uh saying like hey man you could there's better ways you could have done that or there's like or what <laughs> i don't know wait until we hire you as a penetration tester or something like there's there's this kind of I don't want to say white knight, but it is this kind of like uh, Robin Hood type mentality where it's like, if I think I'm doing good, I have free reign to do whatever I want. And that is a kind of a, a sticky or a, a, a touchy part of the, the hacker mentality. I think that that kind of touches into a lot of this other stuff. Yeah, sure. And it's absolutely not narcissistic, of course. I am the hero. I am the, like you said, the white knight on horseback who's riding into town to 
do whatever but yeah um yeah and, and i i have a problem uh, again i'm gonna have to try and be careful about what i'm saying here I have a problem with this whole notion of I hacked into the system in order to prove that the system had vulnerabilities and therefore help them improve the system. Because what does that ultimately serve? It ultimately serves the security of the system. It doesn't improve the security of me or you. Not really. Um, it doesn't benefit mm -hmm. us particularly. It only really benefits the system itself, the, the power mechanism of control. What did they really help to do? They helped make the power mechanism of control that little bit more efficient and effective. Great, great job, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You, you've only helped to divide information further. Good job. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, I think that's, and that, I think that, that interestingly kind of counters the entire mindset, which is, I think is even a subculture of the hacking culture, is the, the open source and free software type culture where information all should be free. And I think that's like the mentality maybe Manning was coming from, whereas Lamo thinks that, no, I just feel like I should be able to pull up to my neighbor's house, hack their Wi-Fi, and then knock on their door and say, hey, by the way, your Wi-Fi is open. Like, there's this mentality where, I mean, yeah, if it's your neighbor, it's slightly different than than helping to reinforce the some, some massive military system. And no, I don't think that the schematics for the bombs should be totally available out on the web. But I, I think that there is, like, a... I think there are very important parts to both sides of that. And I think that as far as, like, the right answer on either side uh where the the boundaries are it it gets i think it gets very very tough like tough to to actually make that distinction well i'm all in favor of um things that protect personal privacy because i think individuality individual consciousness is you know without personal privacy those things are extraordinarily difficult to maintain and let alone have them thrive so I'm all in favor of anything that does that, unless, um, even there, though, I've got this sort of nagging reservation about, you could make the argument, um, we were discussing in our emails this, this absurd tabloid controversy recently that was uh, called the happening, and then the snapping we had. Uh, the happening was a hack of the iCloud service, and basically someone, 18 people perhaps, got hold of a whole bunch of celebrity nudie pics that they put on the mobile phones. And I'm not particularly sympathetic towards celebrities on even my best day, so I don't give a fuck about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but what it did do is, is, you know, this story went mainstream. It starts out, <laughs> the whole thing is very, very weird. On going to this service, it seems that they were, they'd hacked this either a long time ago or they'd had access to it over a long period of time. Because apparently, some of these movies were pretty old and should have been deleted, obviously, weren't, but should have been deleted like three years ago. So, you're thinking, who were these people? Who did this? Um, I can totally believe that this was an organic group of hackers that did this. I can believe that hypothesis. I just wonder, is there more to it than that? And why did they choose all things? This, like, you know, they, they choose 4chan to post these images on the internet in the first place. They didn't use, you know, torrents. They didn't use some file downloading site. They didn't use YouTube. They didn't use... Um, right. Of all the websites to choose, they chose one that looked like it was built in 1997. <laughs> I mean, I... And I think it probably was actually built pretty close to 1997, actually. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure if you, you know the background of 4chan, but the, the guy who created it, I think it was mostly an anime and video game conversation site. And I think the guy was 15 or 17 when he first made the site. And it's just basically been up in this original state for a really, really long time. Um, so I don't it's a great example of early hacker culture on the internet, right? Ab absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it really is a, a kid, probably high, like uh, definitely in high school, uh, uh, unless he dropped out or some high school age, uh, and yeah, just kind of hack hacking away at his keyboard, putting together some basic board where it's like I don't really care about like making a user login system is actually a pain in the ass. It's way easier to let people like just anonymously post stuff. So, <laughs> so that, I mean, like there are certain kind of degrees of just like, this is like what was easiest to do. He put it up and people liked it and it slash people used it. And, and, and you're right. This is the same site where people will like the, the, like some of the early, like swatting came from where there'd be like a, a some young, 
like a picture of a young girl posted up there and the rest of the community would go and download all the meta like grab the picture rip up all the metal metadata out of it and then find out like oh this guy's camera phone happened to put the gps coordinates on the picture and then boom we're sending cops to this guy's house like this is the same <laughs> this is really the same kind of like forum for for that thing and i so yeah as far as like would you would knowing that especially as like i'm a very tertiary member of that community i i, I occasionally hop on and then go about a half a page down and say like, what am i doing here and then scroll away like hop away but because it, it, it's usually pretty vile stuff on the site but it's it, it is definitely interesting as far as like why would anyone who is even close to part of that culture like the culture of 4chan specifically why would they want to like you know that this is the the that the community is active in these types of ways why, why would you want to potentially like put yourself at risk by by doing that and the iCloud stuff I think it's I don't know if there's a whole lot of malice uh oh, internet connection can you hear me sorry connection oh. went will be there yep yep all good I saw that I'll, I'll pause that a little bit that's a okay yes yes I can hear you fine can you hear me can you hear me? Hello, hello. This is being oh. very wobbly on. Interesting. Yeah. You seem to be back. Okay. Are we good? Can we hear me now? Is that okay? Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. Um. Okay. Uh, let uh, me give you. Still, still picking up. I'm getting uh, try calling, try calling back. Yeah, yeah. 